Why, hello, friends. It's a pleasure to see you again. Have you been well since the last time we were together? We do hope so. We care oh so much about each and every one of you. And whether you're big, a small, a short or a tall, a singlet or a system, we welcome you. And we're glad that you can join us and listen to our stories here. Speaking of which, how are we enjoying the Forgotten Door so far? Hmm? Very interesting, don't you think? Especially the last chapter, wherein Little John and Mr. Bean found the portal to the door, but alas, it seems to have been broken. How terribly curious that it might be inside of what is effectively a giant geode. Mmm, fascinating. But unfortunately, their revelations were cut rather short by an unexpected and unpleasant encounter with Gilby and Mr. Detective Bush. So, with Detective Bush on his way to talk with Little John and Mr. Bean at their house, we wonder what will happen next. Well, we're about to find out. But first... Are you ready yet? Do you have your blankie, or your stuffy, or your pipe, or your bowl, or whatever it is that makes you feel more comfortable? If not, go and get them. We'll be right here waiting for you. After all, we have nothing better to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, have you got them now? Excellent. Now then, sit back, relax, put your best listening ears on as we read Chapter 7 of The Forgotten Door. The Forgotten Door by Alexander Key Illustrated by Dom Lupo. Chapter 7. He is Accused. It was nearly dark when they reached the house. Little John glimpsed Brooks and Sally running from the barn to meet them, and he could hear Rascal whining impatiently in the enclosure, eager to see him and yet reproachful at being left alone all day. He wished suddenly that he had managed to take Rascal with him. The big dog would have loved it. Maybe tomorrow. Remember, Thomas was saying as he set the brakes and turned off the motor, if Bush insists on asking you questions, let me think the answers before you tell him anything. He can't make us answer, only a court can do that, but I don't want him dragging us into court. Hi, Dad, Brooks called. School's out today. Yowie! Mommy said you'd gone rock hunting, Sally said eagerly, running ahead of Brooks. Did you find any pretty stones? A few. Where's your mother? Here, Thomas, said Mary Bean, appearing from around the side of the house. What kept you so late? Trouble, Thomas said hastily. We ran into Gilby and that deputy on the way back, and Gilby recognized John. Bush is on his way over to ask more questions. Keep Sally and Brooks in the kitchen. John, you might stay out of sight in the living room, but close enough to hear. I'll talk to Bush on the porch. Hurry, here he comes. It was a warm evening, and the windows had been opened. Little John, huddled in a chair in the darkened room, heard the deputy's feet on the porch, and Thomas Bean's polite voice offering him a seat. "'Would you care for some coffee, sir?' Thomas asked. "'I think Miss Bean has a fresh pot ready.' "'No thanks,' came the deputy's grating reply. "'I just want to talk to that boy. Will you get him out here, please?' "'I don't see any real reason to, Mr. Bush. I'll answer your questions.' Mr. Bean, by your own admission, you didn't see that boy until Saturday evening. How can you tell me what the boy was doing the rest of the day? I know where he was, Thomas said. I know he's no thief, and I don't care to have him questioned about a matter that doesn't concern him. You told me his parents were dead, Mr. Bean. Are you his legal guardian? I have charge of him for the time being. Then I gather you're not his legal guardian. Will you kindly tell me who is? Thomas stood up, and little John could feel the rising anger in him. Mr. Bush, the only thing that concerns you is to clear up that theft. You're not going to clear it up by wasting your time here. There are other boys in this area you should be investigating. Mr. Bean, said Anderson Bush, in his deadly patient voice, you are being very 
evasive. When people are afraid to answer questions, that means they have something to hide. What are you trying to hide, Mr. Bean? I'm trying to protect an innocent boy who's had a very bad experience. Little John could almost see Anderson Bush shaking his head. You're making a mistake, Mr. Bean. I've investigated all other possible suspects and checked them out. This boy, this John O'Connor, is the only one left who could have done it. He was seen, under very strange circumstances, near the Holiday Place early Saturday. He's small enough to have squeezed through that window, and there are prints in the dust that could have been made by his boots. The deputy paused and went on slowly. I realize how you feel, Mr. Bean. It's never pleasant to have anyone connected with you accused of a thing like this. But if it's his first offense, and all the stolen property can be recovered, we don't have to be too hard on him. If you'll just call that boy out here and let me talk to him, you'll save yourself some trouble. No, Thomas said firmly. I'll not have him questioned. He had nothing to do with this. But little John was already coming through the door. Thomas, he realized, could protect him no longer without making things worse than they were. He thrust his small hands into his pockets to hide their unsteadiness and shook his head at Thomas Bean's silent urging to leave. How strange, he thought, looking intently at Anderson Bush, that people here would want to make life such an ugly sort of game. Somewhere, wherever he had come from, there couldn't be this ugliness or any of these secret hates and desires that darkened everything. Now John, Anderson Bush was saying, with a friendliness that little John knew was completely false, I'm glad you decided to come out and clear this thing up. We don't like to see young fellows like you being sent to reform school. So, if you'll tell me where you put those things you took the other day... Mr. Bush, he said, may I ask you a question, please? You'd better start answering questions instead of asking them, the deputy said testily. I only wanted to ask you where Mr. Macklin said his boys were Sunday afternoon. You can't blame this on the Macklin boys. The whole family was in town all Saturday, at church the next morning, and at Blue Lake with friends all Sunday afternoon. I checked it. Little John turned to Thomas. Mr. Bean, do you remember when Mr. Macklin rode by Monday looking for his boys? Can you tell Mr. Bush what he said? Let me think, said Thomas. Hmm. He said Tip and Lenny had skipped school and were out hunting that wild boy. Gilby Pitts had told him about it at church. He said... Suddenly, Thomas sat up and snapped his fingers. I'd entirely forgotten it, but Angus said his boys were away all Sunday afternoon doing the same thing. That means Angus was lying if he said Tip and Lenny were with them at Blue Lake. In the darkness, it was hard to see the deputy's face, but his voice was cold as he spoke. You have a very convenient memory, Mr. Bean. It proves nothing, and it doesn't explain what this boy, this John O'Connor, as you call him, was doing when Gilby Pitts caught him Saturday. Just who is this boy, Mr. Bean? You've admitted you're not his guardian. Who brought him here, and why is he staying with you? Blast your nosiness, Thomas exploded. He's the orphan son of Captain James O'Connor of the Marines who was killed in North Africa three months ago. The boy has lost his memory and he was brought here by regular Marine channels because he needs a quiet place to recuperate. I happen to be O'Connor's friend and his former commanding officer. Enough of that. The only thing that concerns you is the robbery. If you don't believe what I've told you about Macklin, you'd better go over there and have it out with him. We'll all go over, Anderson Bush snapped back. Get in the car, you two. It was less than half a mile up the valley. The deputy drove grimly through the night. Little John could feel the coiled anger in him, and he wished Thomas hadn't lost his temper and told the lie. He loved Thomas for trying to protect him, but the lie was a mistake. There were old hates in Anderson Bush, ugly things of the past that made the man the way he was now. Little John wished the thoughts were not there to be seen, but they leaped out as strongly as if the deputy had shouted them aloud. Anderson Bush had been in trouble in the army, and he hated all officers because of it. Later, there had been trouble over a son. The car stopped with an angry jerk before a weathered farmhouse. Anderson Bush slid out, and they followed him up to the dim porch where a hound backed away, barking. The door opened, spilling light upon them, and Angus Macklin stood there blinking. As Angus recognized the deputy, little John was aware of a flicker of uneasiness in him. 
Watch Mr. Bush, said Angus, smiling. Thought you was Gilby at first. Are you expecting Gilby Pitt? Yeah, he phoned about that wild boy, said. Angus stopped, his eyes widening as he saw little John behind Thomas. Tom, I declare, is that really him? Thomas Bean ignored him. There's Gilby coming up now, he growled as light swung up the road. Going to be a nice party. The approaching truck stopped behind the deputy's car. Gilby and Emma Pitts got out and came up onto the porch. Gilby whispered hoarsely, There's that boy. And Emma said, I want to see him. I want to see him in the light. They followed Angus into the big ugly living room where a single glaring bulb hung from the ceiling. A pinched woman with her hands wadded nervously in her apron stared at them from the back hall. Little John guessed that she must be Mrs. Macklin. He was wondering about the Macklin boys when Emma Pitt suddenly grabbed his arm and jerked him under the light. She was dressed in overalls just as he had seen her in the field that first morning. He forced himself to look steadily into her hard pebble eyes and was surprised to see the sudden dawn of fear in them. All at once, she was backing away, exclaiming, That's him! You cut his hair and changed his clothes, Tom Bean, but you ain't hiding what he is. He's that same wild boy, and there's something mighty queer. He ain't natural, muttered Gilby Pitts. He sure ain't, said Angus Macklin, backing away. I can see it in his face. Anything that runs wild critters and jumps like them. Thomas burst out in angry disgust. For Pete's sake, John's not going to bite any of you, but it would serve you right if he did. Mr. Bush, I'll thank you to settle this business and take us home. We haven't had our supper yet. Hold your horses, Anderson Bush ordered. Mr. Macklin, where's Tip and Lenny? Round barn somewhere, Angus replied. They got chores. Little John tugged at Thomas Bean's sleeve and whispered the thing that Angus was worried about. Thomas straightened. Angus, he demanded, do those chores take your boys as far over as the Johnson place? How come you say that, Tom? Because we just came by the Johnson place. It's not too dark to see a couple boys crossing your pasture if you happen to be watching. Couldn't make out what they were carrying. But it's not hard to guess. The smile had frozen on Angus Macklin's face. You don't sound very neighborly, Tom. I've missed too many hams last winter to be in a very neighborly mood, Thomas snapped back, finally sure of his ground. You told Bush you'd taken Tip and Lenny to Blue Lake Sunday, but you told me they were out hunting that wild boy. You, you heard me wrong. I never said no such... Pipe down! Thomas's voice had a military ring that made Angus flinch. I'm settling this right now. Your kids ran off Sunday and swiped that stuff from holidays. Lenny went through the window. He's small enough. They thought they could blame it on that so-called wild boy. But with the law buzzing around all day, you got to worrying about having stolen property on the place. So tonight, you sent Tip and Lenny off to hide the things near the Johnsons. Thomas swung determinedly towards the door. Come on, Bush. Get your flashlight. We don't need a search warrant for this. I'll bet those things are hidden on the edge of Johnson's woods. They won't be hard to find. You're taking a lot on yourself, Anderson Bush said coldly. You'd better be sure what you're doing. Emma Pitts cried, If you find them things in the woods, it'll be because that wild varmint put them there. You've got a lot of nerve, Tom Bean, trying to blame it on Angus's boys. There'll be fingerprints, Thomas reminded her and limped outside. Reluctantly, Anderson Bush got a flashlight from his car and they started across the pasture below the house. A mist was settling down from the ridge, making the night darker than it had been. After a hundred yards, the deputy stopped. Mr. Bean, he grated, I've heard enough lies for one night. It would have been impossible to have seen anyone out here when we drove by. What kind of trick are you trying to pull? Little John tugged at Thomas Bean's sleeve. Over there, he said, pointing into the mist. The deputy swung his light, and Thomas called, Tip! Lenny! Come here! Two vague forms materialized in the beam of the light. They started to run, then halted as the deputy shouted. They came over slowly, two slender boys in soiled and patched jeans, with something secretive in their knobby faces that reminded little John of Mrs. Macklin. Suddenly, he felt sorry for Mrs. Macklin and for Tip and Lenny. Anderson Bush demanded, What are you boys doing out here? We got a right to be here, Tip, the taller one said defiantly. This here is our land. Thomas said, You were coming back from Johnson's woods. Take us back the way you came. What for? We ain't ever been over there. You were seen over there. Get going. You never seen us, cried Lenny. It must have been... 
It must have been that wild boy, Tip said. We would come back from the barn when we thought we saw something out here, bet it was that wild boy. Get going, Thomas Bean repeated. Take us where you hid those things. There were loud denials. Tip cried, How you think we gonna find something in the dark we don't know nothing about? They were approaching the lower fence. Poplar thickets and brush loomed dimly on the other side. Anderson Bush began moving slowly along the fence, directing his light into the brush. Once, Little John plucked silently at Thomas Bean's sleeve and pointed. Thomas nodded and whispered, Wait, we don't want this to look too easy. They reached the corner near the road, and the deputy turned back. Now he crawled through the fence and very carefully began scuffling through the brush as he swung his light about. Thomas and Little John followed him, but Tip and Lenny stubbornly refused to leave the pasture. The mist settled lower and presently it became so thick that the power of the light beam was lost after a few yards. Anderson Bush said, It would take a hundred men to find anything out here tonight, if there's anything to find. Let me have the light a minute, said Thomas. I thought I saw something gleam way over in yonder. Thomas took the light and, guided by tugs of Little John's hand on his sleeve, plunged deeper into the woods. Little John stopped suddenly before a clump of small cedars growing close to the ground. There was nothing to be seen until he reached in with the toe of his boot and raked out the butt of a fishing rod. Thomas whistled softly. They really had them hidden, he muttered. Bush will never believe we didn't know where they were. Careful, don't touch anything with your hands. Thomas raised his voice and called the deputy. Little John watched while Anderson Bush carefully drew two fishing rods, a tackle box, and an expensive target rifle from under the cedars. The deputy remained grimly silent until he had tied the fishing rods and the tackle box together with his handkerchief and looped the gun strap over his shoulder. Mr. Bean, he said at last, you not only have a very convenient memory, but you and that boy have an exceptional ability to locate things you claim you have no knowledge of. But I'll ask you no more questions. I'll leave that to the court. Very well, snapped Thomas, if that's the way you want to play it. But make sure you check all the fingerprints on those things, and in the house as well. You can depend on that, Mr. Bean. Well, now, that was quite the chapter, wasn't it? Mmm, lots of exciting things happened. Basically, Thomas Bean told Mr. Detective Bush where he could stick it and decided to go right up the road in order to see what the Macklins had to say. The two boys, Tip and Lenny, were more or less caught in flagrante delicto with the stolen fishing rods and the rifle, and yet they completely denied it. So... What will happen next? Will Detective Bush look into Mr. Bean's military explanation? Will things get even more complicated? We'll have to tune in next time to find out, won't we? But for now, we'd like to thank you for joining us here on Percival Reads, and we'd like to remind you to please click like, share, and subscribe. And of course, as always, we remind you that you are loved that you are strong, and that you are not alone. I'm Percival. Thank you for watching.